This is Mike Dawson, and I welcome you to my Dreamers to Makers podcast, where I interview curious people that do extraordinary things. Today's guest is David Chudwin. He's the author of the book, I Was a Teenage Space Reporter, published by LID Publishing. This book is about David's experiences as a young newspaper reporter covering the historic Apollo 11 space mission for his university newspaper, the Michigan Daily, based at the University of Michigan. His informal style takes the reader back to the days when daily reality was space missions to the Earth's moon. He was the only NASA credentialed college newspaper reporter at Cape Canaveral during the moonshot. And his book, I Was a Teenage Space Reporter, expertly chronicles his magical experiences as a 19-year-old journalist. So listen and enjoy. that I noticed uh, in uh, reading uh, your book right off the bat was the informal nature of your uh, manner of uh, writing. Um, now, I didn't really try to track down other than what you had written in your book about some of the articles that you did when you were uh, writing over at the, the Michigan Daily. Did you have that style of writing even back then where you were, uh, uh, you know, kind of informal or were you kind of uh, doing something from a style sheet because it was uh, uh, kind of like a training ground for journalists writing over there at the University of Michigan? No, it was more uh, kind of uh, um, a formal style of writing. Uh, when I decided to write this book, uh, I was a teenage face reporter. I consciously wrote it with a conversational tone. I wanted to write it as if I was sitting in the same room with somebody explaining all the events that had happened and the implications for our future in space. Yeah, you know, I mean, I noticed, you know, the informal nature of it, but one of the things that stuck out for me right away was the sense of immediacy. Um, and, and, I, and I must say that because I had just seen the documentary film uh, Apollo 11 with all of that new uh, uh, film footage. I had watched the movie and then a couple of days later I had gotten the book and was reading it. And, and those both of those artifacts, your book and that film, have that sense of immediacy. So I'm glad to hear that that was uh, one of your primary goals is to uh, you know have that sense of being there and you know probably for you it's it's somewhat of a time machine effect because you're you're trying to think about what you were feeling and what you were thinking you know even this, even though these things were 50 years ago well i first of all the apollo 11 documentary is the closest thing to actually being there i think it's a, a excellent uh, documentary and film and uh, i really enjoyed it it really brought back some uh, important memories uh, but uh, I really enjoyed writing this book because I was able to place myself back 50 years ago when I was a 19-year-old teenager and had this incredible opportunity to cover the first moon launch. Uh, I, at, the, at the time, um, I knew that this was something special, but as the decades have gone by, it was even more special, and that's one of the reasons that I decided to write the book. Uh, first of all, for young individuals to try and inspire them. And second of all, for older people like myself to bring back those days with a sense of nostalgia. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something I noticed, too, uh, in watching the film, uh, David, is the fact that it that it reminded me because I was actually there, too. I I was a, a young boy. My my brother was stationed at Cape Canaveral. And uh, well, actually, Patrick Air Force Base, I should say. And uh, so, because of him uh, being based there, my family went there to go see the moonshot. And so, I was totally back in that moment because it's the first time I ever felt it right. 
the sound, the, 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 the vibe of it was certainly something that I had uh, not uh, uh, had that feeling since the, that time when I was a young boy. So if you're saying that that was spot on, then I have to agree with you. It was absolutely a well done. Um, you know, so maybe we can start from the beginning here. Uh, in terms of you, David, you grew up in the Midwest. You were born in Chicago. Um, your parents are educated. Your dad was a physician, right? That's correct. Yeah. Now, he um, – what what's, uh, type of practice did, did he have? I know you're uh, an allergist and an immunologist, but what was his uh, practice at that, at that time? Uh, my father was a, a radiologist uh, at, at that time. And actually, my, my father transmitted to me uh, an interest in uh, astronomy. Uh, and uh, as, as a high school student, he actually ground a mirror for a telescope by hand and had always been interested in, in astronomy. Of course, uh, there was no space exploration uh, when he grew up in the 1930s. Uh, but I, I think that some of my interest comes from him. But a lot of the interest was just being in the right place at the right time and being very lucky. Uh, you know, he's born in 1950. So when the first artificial satellite was launched by the Russians, Sputnik, in 1957, I was a very impressionable seven-year-old boy. Uh, and uh, at about the same time, I had an interest in science fiction. Um, the juvenile novels by Robert Heinlein were coming out then, and I uh, enjoyed every one of them. And so I had an interest uh, in this very, very early in, in my childhood. Yeah. So um, your mother uh, uh, probably had a, a, a big uh, role in your early education. Did, was she the type of a mother that was uh, kind of just uh, putting things in front of you and make you aware of them? Or do you think it was just simply because space exploration was the hot thing at the time? And so you picked up on it anyway uh, irregardless of your uh, parents uh, making you aware of those things when you were a young boy? I think the second is the case, that uh, when Sputnik was launched, uh, this was a, a major uh, upset in the American psyche. Uh, you know, the Americans had been taught that the capitalistic system was the best, that we accomplished everything. Uh, and then here, the Russians, in October 1957, uh, in a surprise move, launch an artificial space satellite. And I'll always remember the sound from Sputnik. Uh, it let out a radio sound with a beep, beep, beep. And uh, this was, at the time, frightening to people in the United States. And there was a big um, attempt, big backlash to this um, Soviet victory for the U.S. to accomplish things in space. Certainly, it has to be one of the most singular moments in history if we look at uh, you know how the Russians leaped ahead uh, in the so-called space race, even though it wasn't called that at that time. Um, certainly, there was an arms race going on, and the way that most historians look at that time period and why America got uh, involved in the space race – one of the side benefits, of course, was the exploration aspect of it, but it was more about the uh, the, uh, the 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 fear that uh, there could be a, a thermonuclear attack, and there was uh, certainly a, a great, as you say, a great fear that the Russians, because they could put an object into space and control it in such a fine way, that uh, they could certainly do the same thing with an interballistic missile and. Uh, 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 make things uh, very problematic for the world. You, you have to remember that the Soviets set all the initial records uh, in space exploration, the first artificial space satellite, the first dogs in space, um, the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, uh, the first multiple space capsules in space at the same time. And it wasn't until much later in December 1965 that the U.S. started to, to catch up. One of the big Soviet advantages early in the space race was they had reliable boosters, whereas U.S. rockets kept exploding. Uh, and this was in the full glare of publicity because the U.S. was open about their launches, and we never heard about Russian launch failures. <laughs> 
That's that's true because of the the, the, the communist society. Uh, it was uh, not uh, common knowledge how they were progressing. You just heard about it once the uh, announcement was made, or that the, the intelligence communities could detect that something had happened, and that the uh, the publicity of the communist propaganda machine would just simply confirm what was actually happening. You know, the thing that I remember as growing up in the '60s was just the uh, the the uh, existential fear of uh, nuclear weapons, but at the same moment, the absolute joy of the space race. I think that when you're a young kid, uh, the space race was absolutely the most extraordinary thing that that was ever. Uh, 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 contemplated by humans, it just seemed like we were living in our in our own science fiction novel. That's correct. One of the things about the young people of the day today, and one of the reasons I wrote the book, was to try and transmit that sense of excitement at, at the time. Uh, you know, now it's taken for granted that people can go into space. Uh, in the early 1950s, there were some scientists that think that people couldn't uh, survive. Uh, the microgravity and vacuum of, of space, uh, and that whether there are questions even whether human space travel was possible at all. Uh, and also with regard to Apollo, um, there was a lot of doubts at the time, even among scientists, that uh, humans could successfully land on the moon. And so what we take for granted today and what is almost ancient history with this 50th anniversary uh, it's it's a different world now than when we were growing up and when this was new and untried and very exciting. I I completely agree. David, you know, when you were still in, in, in high school, um, did you have any thoughts about wanting to be an astronaut or involved in the space program in any way? Well, I thought about being an astronaut when I was very young. Um my eighth birthday present was a book called Space Pilots by the German rocket scientist Willy Ley. Uh, and this was even before any men were in space, was a uh, portrayal of uh, training of the first uh, space travelers. Uh, so I thought about it, but then um, reality got in the way. Uh, I have terrible eyesight. Uh, even with the relaxed standards today, I could never qualify to be an astronaut. Uh, and then also um, later I realized that I was claustrophobic as well. So I decided to be an armchair astronaut rather than a real one. <laughs> well, you know, I think we all uh, want to be uh, uh, something like a, a heroic figure, like an astronaut or a, a soldier or a doctor. So I think you becoming a doctor was a fair trade in that regard, David. So, you know, another thought that comes to my mind, uh, I remember reading in, in the book that you definitely had an interest in journalism as a, as a high school uh, student. Tell me what it was like, if, what you can remember of writing uh, for The Torch. Well, The Torch was our high school newspaper, and uh, I wrote some editorials and I uh, wrote some news reports from it. But but even then, I was interested in space. Uh when I was still in high school, I wrote to NASA Public Affairs Office in Houston at the what was then the Manned Spacecraft Center and asked them about interviewing an astronaut uh, remotely. Uh, and so I ended up uh, interviewing uh, Bill Anders, who was on Apollo 8 uh, in early 1967. Uh, and I sent in a list of questions and then I received a tape back uh, with his replies uh, as asked by one of the public affairs officers there. So even in, in high school, I was starting to write about space. So when I got to the University of Michigan in August 1968, it was uh, uh, natural for me to look into the student newspaper there, the Michigan Daily. Now, the Michigan Daily is an old institution. It was founded in 1890. And the University of Michigan has never really had a full journalism department. Most of the people there got practical experience by, by working on, on the daily. So the, the, the newspaper at, uh, well, I guess both newspapers, the, the one at your high school. Uh, and tell me again, where was the, your high school? My high school was called Rich, Central, Rich Township Central High School, and it was in Olympia Fields, uh, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. 
Okay, yeah, now I remember. And uh, the Michigan Daily, as you say, it seemed to be more of a training ground for journalists, even though the University of Michigan uh, didn't have a, a journalism degree that was offered, I guess. Right, that's correct. And uh, But uh, you know, through the years, uh, hundreds of uh, journalists have come from the Michigan Daily, and it has a kind of long and storied tradition of, of training young journalists. Well, you know, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, one of the other things that you and I have in common is um, I lived in Ann Arbor as a young boy uh, because of my grandparents. So uh, in the early 70s, I, uh, I saw a lot of guys and gals uh, riding their 10 speed zipping around and they all looked like they just uh, got off the bus from Woodstock. That's what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the thing about the Michigan Daily, and I and I had forgotten uh, your uh, 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 words about uh, uh, working there specifically. But can you tell me a little bit more about how you got that job? Um, uh, and you were a writer. You ultimately became an editor. Uh, clearly, uh, in the, was it 1972? But you started out as a writer, and that's how you got the gig to uh, go to Cape Kennedy. Tell me how you got the job and the process of getting the opportunity to uh, be a part of the uh, uh, representing the college uh, press? Well, when I when I went to uh, Ann Arbor in August 1968 as a freshman, you know, I was looking to join some activities and the daily was a logical thing. So they had a recruitment meeting and uh, I went to it and then I joined it, the new staff uh, of, of the daily. Now, you have to remember, I was the only person in that entire building that had any interest whatsoever in space. Um, a lot of my fellow daily staffers were um, humanities major, political science, philosophy, uh, or they had no idea whatsoever what they were going into. Uh, and um, so I kind of uh, st stood out in that sense. Uh, and an example of that is uh, after the first manned Apollo flight, Apollo 7 in October 1968, uh, they needed. They decided to have an editorial written about space exploration, and even as a, f a new freshman, I got that job because I, I was the only one who had any interest at all in it. Uh, and I wrote an editorial called "The Case for Outer Space," which I think stands up pretty good over fifty years later. So you know, the thing that I was also uh, uh, mulling over as you were discussing that uh, uh, detail in the book was the uh, the situation on college campuses in America because you were in the at, at the height of the Vietnam War. Perhaps the space program was kind of looked at with the same uh, skeptical and dim view as the way uh, uh, college age kids looked at the military as something uh, to be avoided and to be uh, uh, not celebrated. Uh, did you find that to be the case? And, and that's probably why you got that job is because you were the only one that uh, that uh, even had a open, uh, an open mind to uh, write about such a subject. Mike, you're exactly right. Um, the uh, space program was considered part of the military industrial complex. And even though NASA was a civilian agency, it was it was grouped together. Uh, and um, so there was a lot of doubts about with among college age students then um, about space. There were some that were passionate about it, such as myself, but but many were either neutral about it or hostile. And it's it's interesting that that's one of the subjects that I covered in an interview of the NASA's head of manned space flight, uh, who I had an opportunity to interview uh, when I was down to cover the launch. But but I asked George Miller about what the space program was doing to people. And his reply is, you should ask what the space program is doing for people and all the benefits of space exploration in terms of economic development uh, and scientific discovery. Do you think that the, the, the NASA administrator and his uh, uh, staff did a good job of communicating those things at the time? Or do you think it was just a lot of it was drowned out by uh, some of the social problems, whether it's civil rights or the Vietnam War? I, I think the second is, is the case. Uh, I think NASA had an exemplary uh, communications and, and marketing program. And uh, in, in fact, uh, there's an excellent book called Marketing the Moon uh, 
that was published a couple of years ago by my friend Rich Jurek and, and Dave Meerman Scott that explores NASA's marketing and NASA's public relations, and uh, they gave them high marks. And I agree with that, and I think it, it was drowned out a, a lot. Uh, but, you know, 1968 and 69 were very strange years, uh, and it was a kind of special time to be a freshman and sophomore in college at, at the time because so much is going on. Uh, the Apollo 11 was part of the summer of 1969, which was one of the most remarkable times uh, in, the, in the last decades. And uh, just for an example, um, I in the summer of 1969, I had a summer job selling men's clothing uh, in a nice store on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. I could only take one week off. Uh, that was the terms of my employment. Uh, and um, when I was thinking about Apollo 11, um, I also heard plans for a music festival that was going to be occur in, in August 1969 in New York. And to make a long story short, I had a choice between going to Woodstock or to Apollo 11. Uh, and I uh, decided to go to Apollo 11, thinking that, that that would be more historic, although there haven't been really any music festivals like Woodstock since then. <laughs> well, that's for sure. And they certainly tried to recreate it, but I think that's lightning in a bottle that's not going to be recaptured. And uh, clearly you made the, the correct choice because we're here today. You know, so, you know, you're, you're talking a little bit more. Well, let me ask this question differently. Can you tell me a little bit more about the process that got you the uh, the uh, credential to travel to a Florida and cover the Apollo 11 launch? Can you tell me a little bit about how that happened? Sure. Well, in December 1968, I was back home in the Chicago area from uh, Ann Arbor, and a longtime friend of mine who shared an interest in space, a, a gentleman named Marv Rubenstein, Marv suggested to me, he said, why don't we go down and see an Apollo launch, a Saturn V launch this summer? Uh, by then, we will have been 18. And at that, at that time, uh, if you were 18, you could get a motel room, you could rent a car, um, you could even go into a bar and have a drink uh, in those times. Uh, and so we started thinking about going down to the Cape uh, in the summer. Now, we looked at the NASA schedule and saw that Apollo 11 was being scheduled uh, for July, uh, specifically July 16th, 1969. And so we aimed to try and, and go to that uh, if we could arrange it. So the first leap for me was to get permission to cover it for the Michigan Daily. So I approached the senior editors about it. And the, the Daily had long covered uh, out-of-state events, mostly political. So the senior editors um, were agreeable that I would cover it, but they insisted that I had to pay my own way. Uh, it was very low on their priority list to cover a rocket launch uh, with using a sophomore reporter. Uh, usually such gigs went to uh, you know, junior or seniors. So I got approval from the Michigan Daily, and then the next step was to try and go to NASA and get uh, credentials from NASA. And I really hit a roadblock there. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, NASA had over 3,500 requests for press credentials, which was an unprecedented number. Uh, and secondly, they did not consider um, college journalists as professional journalists. They considered them students. So there was a roadblock. And Marv and I considered just going down there without press credentials. Uh, luckily, we persisted, though. And one of the other editors of the Daily was working in Washington that summer as editor of a group of college newspapers called the College Press Service. And he personally went into NASA Public Affairs Office and argued with them that I would be covering it for all the college newspapers and not just the Michigan Daily. Uh, Jim Heck was his name, and he must have been very persuasive uh, because uh, about a month before the launch, I got word that uh, my friend Marv and I had been cr granted press credentials to cover Apollo 11. And uh, I waited each day at the mail to see if they would actually come, since I really didn't believe it unless I had the press pass in my hand. And so um, a little bit after um, June 17th, uh, I got a, a large letter in the mail from NASA with a, a press badge and with press instructions how to cover it. 
So was Marv a, a school buddy of yours from uh, uh, high school days, or was he somebody that you met uh, in uh, college? No, he was somebody actually from grade school, uh, one of my oldest friends, and we shared a deep interest in, in space uh, over many years. Uh, and uh, like, like I said, he was the one who suggested this, uh, and then I went ahead and, um, and kind of brought it to reality. So did, did, did Marv uh, help you remember some of the, 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 the vibe and the facts uh, as you were writing this book? Well, my main sources of uh, remembrance were a notebook that I had kept. Uh, I, I had a small spiral notebook, uh, and I kind of kept a diary of all the events of, from uh, a couple of days before the flight to getting back home uh, a- after the moon landing. And so this diary was invaluable, refreshing my memory. The other thing that refreshed my memory was um, the photos that I had taken. Uh, I took over 100 color slides uh, which provides some really unique images uh, at, at the time. And reviewing those photographs helped me uh, remember events and times and places. Yeah, I, I really thought that that was a great touch, that you had uh, your own uh, photography uh, uh, in the book. Uh, you know, seeing uh, Michael Collins with his uh, uh, lovely little uh, bag, which now I know what was in the bag. <laughs> As he was walking uh, to the van there, that, that, that was a hilarious uh, a little bit of news that I, I had not known before. And uh, th- that was a beautiful touch that you did that. And some of the graphics I thought were really, really nice. I'm looking at the book now. You have this really lovely timeline of uh, uh, space flight starting from uh, the uh, December 1903 with the Wright brothers basically up until this year in 2019 because it's you're just basically uh uh you know writing uh very current and i thought that was a uh, uh, really well done you've had a great team uh to to uh, uh support you in the the creation of this book so the other thing that i was thinking one more thing about your uh preparations to go to to florida was that uh there was no internet back then. There, everything had to be done either by pay phones, long distance calls, and a good old U.S. mail. Uh, do you think that it was uh, something that was uh, uh, burdensome to try to uh, get all these things lined up before you left, or were you gonna go anyway, even if you? Uh, didn't get that, that that credential and just sit there and just kind of be a freelancer kind of on, on the outside of the goldfish bowl looking in. Well, w- one of the joys of writing this book was kind of reliving uh, 1968 and 1969. And the world was a very different place then. Um, there were no personal computers. There was no internet. Um, there were no mobile phones. There was no social media. There was no 24-hour news cycle. Things moved a lot slower. Uh, and uh, so in some ways it made it harder to cover, but in other ways easier. Uh, for example, the stories I wrote for the College Press Service in Michigan Daily, the way I wrote them was um, in the NASA News Center there, they had tables with manual typewriters, and I would sit at this manual typewriter and uh, type out a story and then correct it with pencil marks and things like that uh, because there were no word processors. And then to get the story um, to the newspaper, I would use a rotary dial telephone, dial up the number at the newspaper, and someone at the other end would sit at a typewriter and write out the story as I dictated it. And this is so much different than uh, you know current practices uh, where um, reporters use laptops and instantly get it to the to the newspaper. Yeah, well, you certainly had to have some support from the. Uh from the uh, uh, newspaper back in Ann Arbor. So before you uh, talk a little bit more about the, uh, the uh, month of July, 1969, what, if you had to make a, a list maybe of two or three missions, which missions, whether Russian or American, that stood out to you as the most memorable before the actual moon landing of Apollo 11? Well, I can think of, of two of them right off the bat. Um, the, f- the first one was uh, 
the um, Gemini 76 rendezvous in December 1965. Um, the U.S. had never done the rendezvous, which is bringing two objects together in close proximity in space. Uh, and um, so Gemini 6 with uh, Walter Schirra and Tom Stafford was supposed to be the first uh, rendezvous in, in space. Uh, but the target vehicle, uh, uh, unmanned rocket, uh, blew up. So there was no opportunity f for them that would occur for months. So what NASA officials decided to do was to launch two Gemini spacecraft with crew on board uh, and, um, and then have them meet in space. And this was the first time the United States had leapfrogged ahead of the Russians. Uh, and this was highly successful. Um, uh, Gemini 6 with Tom Stafford and, and Wally Schirra and um, Gemini 7 with uh, um, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell uh, rendezvoused in space and uh, brought back some spectacular pictures uh, of, of the time. Uh, and uh, I think that this mission really stood out uh, with the U.S. leapfrogging the, the Soviets. Um, the other mission that really stood out to me was Apollo 8, uh, the first time the humans had left Earth. And uh, if you remember, Apollo 8, uh, which was launched in uh, December 1968, uh, was the first time uh, humans had orbited the moon. Uh, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders were sent on the first manned Saturn V flight to loop around the moon and go into orbit uh, and then come back to Earth. Uh, and um, this was spectacular. Uh, and there were two manifestations of, of that flight uh, that uh, live on. One is the famous Earthrise picture that uh, Bill Anders took. Uh, the, uh, on one of the orbits of the moon, they were able to see the Earth rising above the surface of the moon uh, when they were in an angle that they were able to observe that. And this picture of a small blue dot of Earth uh, over a rising over uh, the stark lunar landscape uh, really made a, a big impact at, at the time. Uh, later on, uh, people have said that we went to the moon, but we can't. What, what we actually did was we discovered the Earth in, in the sense that the Earth is uh, just a small part of the whole cosmos. The, right. The, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and, and the second thing from Apollo 8 was the Christmas broadcast. Uh, from around the moon. And this was, uh, no one w knew what to expect, uh, but they were scheduled to do a TV broadcast while they were orbiting the moon. And uh, what they did was they read the first 10 verses of, of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Uh, and at the time, uh, this was a very, very emotional event. Uh, and uh, from, I'm reading from the the first part of Genesis and having the stark pictures of the moon surface uh, below uh, in, in the, the TV set. And at the time, it was the most watched Christmas, most watched uh, television broadcast in history uh, and uh, was extremely uh, successful uh, and uh, was widely hailed as, as being a real triumph of uh, U.S. space exploration. You know, I've often wondered if a thousand years from now, whether Apollo 8 and Apollo 11 will be ranked equal in importance just simply because they were so audacious uh, in the mission uh, objectives and being able to accomplish them. What do you well, think Apollo 8 was one of the most audacious and bold decisions NASA ever made. This was going to be the first manned flight of a Saturn V. And all past practices and logic would say that you put people in Earth orbit uh, and, and then bring them back. Uh, but this idea to circle the moon uh, was championed by one of the heads of NASA, a gentleman named George Lowe. Uh, and uh, he persuaded uh, other NASA officials that, that this was the way to go. And this was a very highly successful mission. It was also a very risky mission uh, as well. Do you think that part of that uh, change of plans had to do with the urgency of the space race with the Russians? Well, we know now that the Russians were trying to accomplish the same thing, and they launched a series of Zond, Z-O-N-D, uh, spacecraft uh, to the moon and, and around the moon, and that they were trying to uh, um, you know, beat the United States – 
uh, in terms in terms of that. Uh, and in fact, um, the man who made the first spacewalk, Alexei Leonov, who just turned eighty five. Uh, he was start, s- designated to be the first Russian to go around the moon. You know, th- we could spend the rest of our time just talking about the, the early Apollo missions because of the, the impact of, of what those, uh, what those uh, missions had on the rest of the space program. But, of course, you went to go see Apollo 11. So tell me what it was like when you arrived at the airport uh in Florida, what was the first thing you saw when you got off the plane, and who did you see? Well, Marv and I um, were at left from the Chicago O'Hare Airport, and we were standing in line to check in. And there's this older lady uh, with graying hair in front of us that looked very familiar. And it turned out that this was Mrs. Rose Cernan, uh, astronaut Eugene Cernan's mother. And we had recognized her because we had been at a space event after Apollo, after, I'm sorry, after Gemini 9, uh, where Cernan was a crewman. And he, Cernan uh, grew up in Bellwood, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. And he and Tom Stafford had come back there for a special program. So um, we, we had seen the, the Cernan family before. So um, we said hello to Mrs. Cernan. And then uh, flew on the same plane as her down to Florida, and she was going to see the launch. Uh, And um, so when we got down there, we talked to her again, and her son, Gene Cernan, couldn't pick her up. So another astronaut, Alan Bean, came to pick her up. So she introduced us to Alan Bean, and he, who passed away about a year ago and was one of the people that walked, 12 people that walked on the moon, and there were three other astronauts with Alan Bean, uh, Charlie Duke, who later walked on the moon, Jim Irwin, who later walked on the moon, and also Bruce McCandless, who did the first uh, untethered spacewalk. So just on landing in Florida, within 20 minutes, we met four NASA astronauts, three of whom later walked on the moon. And this was kind of a, a sign of good luck, we thought, uh, that uh, just in, within a few minutes of landing there that we had talked to and hung out with uh, four astronauts. You know, I, I hear about about how informal everything was. Uh, they didn't have, you know, they being the astronauts, they just basically walked around like normal uh, civilians in a lot of ways, even though they were uh, in the midst of this uh, stupendous operation with NASA. The, the folks that I know that live that lived down in Houston at that time, you know, that were neighbors of the astronauts, you know, they were just hanging out and having their barbecues and drinking their beers, you know, as a, as a side note, do you think that James Hansen's uh, book and then it's uh, the, the movie that came out early this year, do you think that that captured some of the, some of the uh, 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 non-space life of the astronauts? Well, first of all, um, Jim Hansen's book, uh, First Man, is an outstanding uh, biography of uh, Neil Armstrong. It's the definitive work on Neil Armstrong, and uh, uh, it's, it's a wonderful book. And in recent years, I've, I've gotten to know uh, Professor Hansen a little bit, and uh, he's uh, an excellent historian. Uh, the movie First Man, I thought was a good movie, but I think it focused on too much on just one part of Neil Armstrong's personality. Uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, you know, hear Neil Armstrong speak live and be at a couple of events where he was at, uh, and also from what I've read about him, uh, he was a had, was a very um, relatively happy, optimistic guy. He laughed. He had a dry sense of humor. Uh, and um, First Man focused more on his reaction to the terrible tragedy he, he and his wife suffered when their daughter passed away from leukemia as a young child. Uh, and, and so First Man is, was not really a documentary about Armstrong per se, but more about this one aspect of his life. And so he w- came off, I think, in that movie as a... Uh, um, to be frank, kind of a sourpuss, and that was very much not the case. Yeah, I ha- I've had a lot of friends uh, uh, say the same thing. Uh, uh, people that have, have had, had the opportunity, as you have, to hear him speak in person and uh, thought that in that one important uh, aspect of the film, the way the screenplay was written, they kind of missed the mark there. Uh, and we, you know, the 
of course, what we're talking about today is about your book. But I, I, I I'm glad you kind of uh, spoke a little bit about the the film uh, First Man. Uh, so here you are. You you got off the plane there in Florida. You and Marv are getting ready to go to the hotel and kind of get organized to cover this uh, 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 moonshot. Tell me uh, a little bit about how that uh, went for you. What were some of the things you had to kind of manage? Uh, b- before uh, the launch? Well, the three days before the launch um, were magical. My 19th birthday was July 11th, 1969. Two days later, on July 13th, we flew down to Florida, which was three days before the launch. And then the days before the launch were filled with press tours, uh, with press conferences, and with just amazing experiences. Uh, and um, so NASA offered a wide range of tours to, uh, to people, and we went on a very exclusive tour with nine other journalists in a minibus, uh, and we were able to get um, up to within 2,000 feet of the Apollo 11 Saturn V. We were able to get on the floor and also on the roof of the vehicle assembly building, the huge structure. Um, we were able to get on the floor of Launch Control Center and actually in a fire room that wasn't being used at the time, um, sit at the f- launch director's console uh, and see all what appeared then to be high tech, although by st- our standards now, it was actually very primitive. You know, that's that's interesting that you uh, uh, talk about uh, the tour. I remember as a young boy uh, being able to uh, see uh, Apollo 12 and Apollo 13 being stacked in the VAB. Do you remember uh, anything about that yourself? Yes. Ac- actually, um, when we got there, um, the Apollo 12 had been stacked uh, just a little while before, and we were able, with press credentials, to get up right up to the base of Apollo 12. We were like uh, you know, 100 feet away from the base of it, and we could see the technicians working in the bottom of it, and we could see two of the huge F1 engines. And uh, so we were able to get right up close to, to Apollo 12. Uh, and um, the um, size of this thing was unimaginable. The, the Saturn V rocket was 363 feet tall and was equivalent to like a 20-story building. Uh, and uh, it, it was just an amazing machine. And like you said, they had um, the different stages when we were there of Apollo 13, which had not yet been stacked. But we saw like the first stage, second and third stages of of Apollo 13, but before they were stacked. And and again, this this was unprecedented access that we would never have had if we had just gone down to Florida. Absolutely. I I think that you you were really fortunate in doing uh, or getting the opportunity to see those things before the launch and get a kind of a taste of uh, the uh, the the undertaking uh, of putting one of those uh, huge rockets together. So the other the other the other advantage of the press passes was that we attended two amazing press conferences Uh, prior to the launch. Uh, One, two days before the launch was called the Center Director's Briefing. And so I was in the same room with with Werner von Braun, the German rocket scientist who was head of Marshall Spacecraft Center, Robert Gilruth, who was the head of Manned Spacecraft Center, uh, Kurt Debus, who was head of Kennedy Space Center, uh, and George Miller, who was head of Manned Spaceflight for NASA. And uh, it was amazing to uh, be there in person uh, as these people were, were questioned live. So what do you remember about uh, the questions themselves from the uh, professional press corps? Was there uh, an obvious uh, disparity between the science reporters and, let's say, uh, kind of -of run-of-the-mill reporters where it might have been obvious that uh, the science reporters had done their research, whereas some of the other guys and gals probably didn't do any research and they were asking uh, pretty much softball questions? Well, the, um, the moderator at these press conferences was uh, Jack King, and Jack was a public affairs official of, for a manned spaceflight of, of NASA, and uh, Jack uh, did a really good job of directing uh, the opportunities to ask questions to uh, you know, people who knew what they were doing. So there was not as much of the fluff questions as you might expect. Uh, 
Besides the press conference with the center directors, there was also a conference the day before launch with all the operational officials uh, for Apollo 11. Uh, and these ranged from uh, NASA astronaut uh, Deke Slayton, who was the head astronaut, to Charles Berry, who was the astronaut doctor, um, to George uh, Lowe, who was the head of the uh, spacecraft program, uh, and a bunch of other people. And uh, they were on a stage at the Launch Complex 39 Press Center, and we were all in the grandstands uh, and asking them, them questions. Uh, but uh, bet between those two groups of people were many of the people that were really responsible for the success of the Apollo program. So after one of these press conferences, did you immediately uh, have to uh, write your article, call the guys up in Ann Arbor and, uh, and talk the, uh, uh, the uh, text, so to speak, back to them? Did you have to do that right away because they had a, a deadline as well? Well, there were deadlines, but the whole news cycle then was a lot slower, uh, which made, in some ways made things a lot easier. Um, so I could wait till the end of the day uh, and uh, sit down and write an article and phone it in, in in the early evening, and it would be able to get into the next morning's newspaper. So the thing that I remember from your book is that you were given – a huge amount of, of press material that had more information than what you would have learned through the actual question and answer periods at, at press conferences. And you still have that stuff, right? Right. I brought a half empty suitcase uh, and it was a good thing I did because I was barely able to fit everything in. So um, NASA had a large number of uh, press releases uh, and also all the companies that made the different parts of the Apollo Saturn V and Apollo capsules, uh, had press releases uh, with information. Uh, plus, on top of that, NASA transcribed word for word the, what was said in these press conferences. And then finally, uh, once the mission got started, uh, NASA transcribed all the voice communication uh, be between uh, the astronauts and the, and the ground. Um, every 30 or 40 minutes, uh, they would put out a new set of sheets that had the typewritten uh, transcript of what had been gone down. So this, uh, this, the transcripts alone uh, made a stack about eight inches high by the time I was ready to leave. Th that's extraordinary. 30 to 40 minutes uh, uh, throughout that, uh, that, those, two, those two weeks, uh, you were getting uh, these transcriptions almost, uh, almost uh, two or three times a day? Well, during the mission, it was um, it was literally every thirty to forty minutes. Wow! <laughs> um, before, before the mission, uh, the transcripts. So, for example, if there was a press conference the next day, we would have transcripts of the entire press conference. Okay, I got you. I, I see. Um, so, what time did you get up, uh, or could you sleep the day before the launch? What what was your what was that uh, morning like? Well, we got up at four thirty in the morning, and it was still dark out. And we, we drove from our motel, the Sea Missile Motel, which was kind of a shady place, um, to, uh, uh, to the NASA News Center, which was uh, in Cape Canaveral. Uh, the regular NASA press facilities at Kennedy Space Center were too small to accommodate these over 3,500 journalists. So NASA had this industrial building, uh, kitty corner to the Cape Kennedy Hilton on Highway A1A uh, in Cape Canaveral. And so we got there uh, and um, got on, uh, there were two or three press buses there. And we had been able to get access to what was call, called the walkout. Um, the walkout is when the astronauts in their spacesuits go from their quarters into the van that takes them to the pad to get on the rocket. And we were able to get special access to the walkout. So um, these three buses go and um, drive into the Kennedy Space Center. You know, there's guards watching and everything like that. And we go to this roped off area across from a building that's now called the Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building, but was then called the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building. And in there was the crew quarters for the astronauts. They were in quarantine before the mission, so they wouldn't get sick. And there were bedrooms in there and a kitchen and a dining room and also uh, spots for them to get uh, suited up into their spacesuits. So we get there uh, around 5.30 in the morning, and uh, there's a ro this roped-off area there. The buses open up, and then there's this mad rush by the journalists 
um, to get good spots right at the front of the rope. Um, I kind of compare it to a rugby scrum because there were like elbows flying and everybody was running there to, to get good position. Uh, Marv and I got a position about three rows back uh, and then we just stood there for a while. Uh, after a, uh, a little while there, um, just kind of standing in the, the humid uh, Florida morning, uh, astronaut Deke Slayton, the chief astronaut, came out and was interviewed for television. And then around 6.30 in the morning, uh, we could see th through the opening of the door of this building, uh, there was a big commotion and a white dot. And as this white dot became closer, we saw that it was astronaut Neil Armstrong in his white spacesuit. And so um, Armstrong was followed by uh, Mike Collins and then Buzz Aldrin. And with grins on their faces and uh, waving and uh, giving thumbs up, um, the astronauts walked out of the manned spacecraft operations building, uh, down a ramp, and into the van. And uh, so that I and the other journalists there were privileged to see the astronauts' last steps on Earth before leaving to the moon. And this was extremely exciting and a very emotional experience uh, for me as well. You know, the thing is that you got some pretty interesting photos uh, of that moment. Uh, tell me about the camera that you used and how, how skillful did you feel at that moment? Did you, were you worried that you were going to blow it and uh, there was going to be no photos uh, on that film? How did you feel about that? Well, first of all, you have to remember that there was no digital photography then. Uh, it just didn't exist. And so um, photographs were taken on actual film uh, that later needed to be developed. Uh, the camera I had with me was actually my dad's. It was a Kodak Retina camera uh, from the 1940s. Uh, and uh, everything was manual. You have to, had to set the time, you had to set the f-stop, uh, and there was no monitor or anything like that to, to help you out. So I, took, I was able to take about five pictures of them uh, walking out uh, in their spacesuits, and I had no idea whatsoever whether they turned out, and I didn't find out until two weeks later when I was back at home and had the color slide film uh, uh, developed. And I, I found out that uh, um, it, at least um, two of the three were outstanding photographs. Yeah, I thought you did a great job under pressure there. So <laughs> the thing is, is that, uh, you know, you, you, you're standing there with all these reporters and everybody is like, it's, I could just imagine it's like that scene in The Right Stuff with the shutters going and it's just got to be just chaos. Did... Did some of those uh, uh, guys kind of lose it, you know, trying to get in position because they didn't get the shot they wanted? Or were they pretty professional and, and low-key about it? No, everybody was going crazy trying to get their shot. I mean, you know, this was professional and this was their living. And the amount of time was – this this thing went by in, in just, uh, you know, 30, 45 seconds. Uh, and so everybody was, was trying to do that. One of the best shots that I missed – was uh, Armstrong giving a thumbs up, and I missed that because a um, reporter's uh, uh, elbow got in the way of the camera. Uh, of course, the flying elbows. So after you guys did that, now uh, was the plan just to get out there uh, by the countdown board and just kind of wait it out, or did you go back to the press facilities and uh, do some more uh, work uh, as a reporter does before you actually do the eyewitness uh, account of watching the launch? Well, the next step was getting in a massive traffic jam. Now, there were over a million people out there, uh, including yourself, uh, outside the Kennedy Space Center, but even inside the Kennedy Space Center, there was a huge traffic jam. So after the walkout, we just kind of sat on the bus as it inched back towards the uh, Launch Complex 39 press site. Eventually, we got to the press site, but Marv and I were walking around, and we ran it, saw this NASA bus that was actually taking reporters to what was called the VIP site, which was the other side of the vehicle assembly building. The VIP site was where NASA had invited um, over 5,000 people from around the United States in, uh, in various uh, capacities uh, to, to witness the launch. And it was an amazing uh, um, opportunity being there at the VIP site uh, we saw actors like Hugh O'Brien. There were television stars like uh, Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon. 
Uh, there were all kinds of uh, senators and politicians. Uh, there were current and former astronauts. Uh, and the, uh, the, the chief guest there was President Lyndon Johnson and late Lady Bird Johnson. Uh, he was out of office by then, but Lyndon Johnson had been the, kind of the godfather of the space program. Uh, he was head of the Senate Space Committee when he was in Congress. He was head of the National Space Council when he was Kennedy's vice president. And when he took over the presidency, he was a strong supporter of NASA and, and Project Apollo. And uh, so he was invited to be a special guest there. And uh, so he came with Secret Service and uh, um, but just sat in the grandstands like everybody else. Yeah, that that's quite an amazing uh, uh, thing that I saw in the Apollo 11 uh, documentary was the uh, the 70 millimeter films of that uh, uh, VIP uh, observation uh, location. And so uh, when when you saw the film, did you see yourself uh, there in the VIP uh, area? No, um, I, I did not, because uh, what, what happened was, uh, as we got closer to the launch, uh, Marv and I decided to walk out a couple hundred yards in front of the VIP area to get a better view of, of the rocket. Um, the rocket was about three and a half miles away from us, uh, and we wanted an unobstructed view. So that's why we're not in, in those pictures, which were taken just prior to launch. So we walked out there, and um, now you might say, why three and a half miles? Well, the Saturn V rocket was actually a big bomb. Uh, for example, there were 700,000 gallons of kerosene in it and also huge amounts of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And if it exploded, the closest that one could be to the pad without suffering certain injury was, was over three miles away. And that's why the launch control center and vehicle assembly buildings, uh, the press site, and this VIP site were all about three miles away from Pad 39A. Yeah, that's for sure. You definitely uh, get a sense of that. Now, I must tell you is that I had no traffic jam problems when we went because my brother being at, at based at uh, Patrick Air Force Base, we were watching it from the base. So we were maybe uh, as close as you are, but we saw it from a different vantage point. So I don't remember a traffic jam. I just remember sleeping until it was time to watch it. So, you know, you're, you're, you're there, you're getting ready to watch it. And then the countdown happens. What were you feeling? And was your heart in your throat? What do you and Marv, when you think about it now, what do you, what do you remember the sensations? Well, first of all, there was a sense of um, trepidation because we knew the risks involved. This was only the third flight of the Saturn V. Uh, but and then there also was concerns about schedules. Uh, if um, the rocket didn't get off within the right window, the right time, uh, they would have had to postpone it at least a couple of days. You know, as I mentioned before, I only had a week off on this. So if there was more than one postponement, uh, then I might end up missing the launch. So we were very concerned whether it actually take off on time. Uh, but the countdown went very well. And uh, months before, it had been scheduled for 9.32 a.m. Eastern Time. And precisely at 9.32 a.m. Eastern Time, we saw as the countdown went to uh, under T minus 10 seconds, we saw a bright yellow uh, light at the base of the rocket. And then a second or two after that, huge flames and smoke shot out from either side of the rocket. But the rocket just seemed to sit there. And in fact, I was almost a little bit worried at the time because there was all this flame and stuff coming out of the base of the rocket and it wasn't moving at all. Uh, but after a couple of seconds, it started to very, very slowly rise up. Uh, and it was still silent at the time. Uh, and it, in retrospect, uh, we found out that it took a full 10 seconds for the Saturn V rocket to clear the tower, for the base of it to get above the tower. Uh, this is very different than the space shuttle, which once the solid rocket engines went off, the thing zoomed right off. This is a very slow uh, rise of, of the rocket. And then the sound hit us. And I don't know what your experience was from Patrick Air Force Base, but it was a, um, a total sensory experience. Um, the ground started to shake. There was vibration. Sound waves pounded at our chest. It was a physical sensation. Uh, and then there was this tremendous roar. Some people have said it was like a hundred locomotives. Uh, 
Uh, and so it was an amazing event that one saw it, but also one heard it and one actually felt it, the vibration and sound waves. You know, I just remember, I was so young, but I just remember being overwhelmed and just remembering the, the sound waves. That was the thing that I remember. It's just how it felt uh, more than anything else. Because it, because to me as a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, it just seemed like it was it was it happened so fast. I mean, you see it on TV and you go, wow, a moon rocket. But then you see it in person and then you feel it and it's something you never forget. But I just remember the noise more than anything. So there you are, David. You you you've seen it. Your you your mind is blown. Now you have to get the work because now you have to kind of capture what you felt and saw in the words. Did you immediately start to work on that uh, that article? No, actually, what Marv and I did was we went back to the motel and took a swim in the swimming pool. <laughs> Again, cool this, this was the days of slow news cycles. And I knew that later in the afternoon or early evening, I could go back to the news center and, and write the story. Uh, and so, uh, again, it's very different than uh, news broadcasting today. Yeah, I, get, I, I just keep forgetting, you know, that yeah, it was all back in telephones and, uh, and uh, typewriters. And, and that sense of urgency was appropriate for the time, but you could go and uh, uh, have, a, uh, have a swim and, and, and a little bit of lunch. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. So do you remember the, the headline that you wrote uh, for uh, the, the Michigan Daily? Uh, I, first of all, I didn't write the headline because the the editors always write the headlines. Um, oh, okay. Oh, but uh, um, I, I what think, would have what would have been your headline? <laughs> well, I, th- I think it was something close to a, a Apollo eleven held heads to the moon. Right, right, right. So, uh, you know, you you think about you know the time period that it took to uh, get to the moon and uh, execute the landing, and then the moonwalk. If I remember right, uh, you didn't hightail it over the Houston to witness the rest of the mission. You stayed in Florida. Why well, did you do that? Well, we were a very low-budget operation. Um, unlike the big national organizations, they could fly everything to Houston to the manned spacecraft center where Mission Control was located. But uh, I didn't have the money to do that. So I watched it with a couple hundred other journalists, uh, mainly foreigners, who – also didn't have the money, uh, at the NASA News Center at Cape Canaveral and followed the mission from there. Uh, and uh, so the, all the hustle and bustle was, was down. But they still had the uh, typewriters available, the rotary phones, uh, and they most importantly had the uh, uh, squawk boxes with the mission commentary. And so, so you, on, on the yeah. day of the moon landing, uh, that's where I uh, followed it. There was a couple of color television sets, uh, there uh, as well. Well, you know, the thing that, that, that struck me when I was reading your account was just the fact that, uh, you know, you stayed there uh, in, in Florida and you were able to, uh, uh, you know, witness it from a unique standpoint, whereas most of the world was watching and listening from the point of view of Houston. You seem to have a, a unique vantage point by staying in Florida. Well, I, I think it was a, a different um, experience. Uh, but again, we relied, though, on uh, the, um, the voice transcripts between the astronauts uh, in space and the people in mission control. Uh, but it was, uh, again, a, a different experience. And the, um, the moon landing was a very uh, nail-biting and, uh, and difficult uh, um, event. Uh, and... Uh, was also a very emotional event when they successfully landed because there had been a number of difficulties uh, leading up to the landing. So tell me what you were feeling when you were hearing the the twelve one alarm. Were you uh, aware that it was uh, uh, very much a possibility that the the landing was going to be aborted? Well, the last twelve minutes of the landing uh, were uh, real nail biters. Uh, there was a number of problems. Um, first of all, there was communication difficulties. And uh, Buzz Aldrin actually had to adjust the antenna so that they would be able to, uh, to communicate at all. Uh, secondly, uh, the, um, 
the maps that were available were not detailed enough to allow them to um, pick out a smooth landing. Uh, and then as part of that, though, um, the second problem was that the trajectory was having them land further than they were supposed to. Uh, and at the, at the time, we didn't know that. Um, the third problem was that they had all these computer alarms at the time. And we didn't know as reporters what those alarms were, but any time you had an alarm was a bad sign uh, because if there's no problem, they're not going to be alarms. So it indicated some sort of problem. Uh, and these computer alarms we know now were due to overloading of the landing computer. The Apollo guidance computers that were guiding them, uh, any of our cell phones now have more memory and capabilities than these very primitive Apollo guidance computers. And the computer was overwhelmed by all the data coming in. Uh, luckily, uh, it had been um, programmed to set priorities and uh, to focus on the landing itself. Uh, but it did set off these alarms. Luckily, in, um, in the training for the mission, uh, where they do simulations or possible flight scenarios, uh, these, these computer alarms came up a couple of times. So when, when they came up, uh, that there were people uh, in mission control, a young controller named Steve Bales, uh, you know, who told the flight director, Gene Kranz, uh, we're still go, uh, and, and that. And... And at the time, we did not realize the challenges that Neil Armstrong was facing trying to land the thing. Uh, because, as I said, first of all, they were headed long. Second of all, the site that they were headed for, he saw that there were huge boulders there, which could you know, fatally damage the lunar module. Um, so he had to fly beyond this boulder field. And beyond the boulder field was a small crater that he also had to fly over. And as a result of this, he started running low on fuel. And at one point near the end of the 12-minute sequence, um, the capsule communicator, Charlie Duke, uh, gives him a call 30 seconds. Uh, and we knew that that was a, a problem because that 30-second call was that they were going to run out of fuel in 30 seconds and they had damn well better find a landing site before then. Yeah, no kidding. I think we were all uh, 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 on our, uh, the edge of our seat uh, as that was uh, uh, unfolding before us all, it's 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 quite a thought to realize is that it was probably the first time in human history where everybody was listening or watching such a momentous event. You couldn't say that about the the Wright brothers. You couldn't say that about let's say uh, D Day or. Uh, it's, it felt like that it was a singular moment in human history that we all got to participate. And, and that, that, that's very true. And, you know, before the mission, uh, NASA officials and the astronauts themselves said that they only expected a 50-50 chance of making a successful landing and coming back. You know, not that there would be a fatality, but, but of, of actually not having to abort the landing or... Uh, you know, having problems that would uh, prevent a landing so that they, there was only a 50-50 chance they would do it. And then on top of it, there were all these uh, kind of unexpected problems uh, during, during the last 12 minutes. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when it landed, it was very emotional to me at the time. Um, I actually had some tears in my eyes. Uh, and I thought of President Kennedy, who set the goal. And I also thought of the crew of Apollo 1, uh, Grissom White and Chaffee, who died in a fire uh, on the first Apollo spacecraft uh, in January 67. Uh, and it was a, a great joy uh, that, uh, you know, that, that we had accomplished this tremendous feat. Yes, uh, indeed. So, you know, just in a few hours, the, uh, the, the two astronauts, Armstrong and Aldrin, you know, they walk on the moon. Uh, we get to watch that in real time on television. Uh, was that also something that you were watching there at uh, Cape Canaveral? Yes, I was there at Cape Canaveral. But, you know, to me, the landing was the momentous event. Um, the first steps on the moon to me were nice uh, publicity, were nice, uh, you know, important scientifically. But to me, the great accomplishment was the landing by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And I think way too much has been made of Neil Armstrong as being the first man to step on the moon. 
Uh, I think it should be that uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first men to land on the moon. As we've heard the analogy uh, made by many of the astronauts that uh, the Apollo crews were just the tip of the spear and it's the entire uh, world community that made it all possible. And, and I think you're appropriate and correct in reminding us that it was uh, an effort that was uh, of many thousands of people. Right. Well, it's estimated over 400,000 people contributed to the Apollo program. And many of these people, for the main contractors, they worked weekends, they stayed late at night, they worked on holidays. This was, in one sense, a crash program to achieve President Kennedy's goal of landing in the, on the moon and returning humans safely back to Earth by the end of the decade. Uh, and uh, there was a real dedication uh, and participation by these hundreds of thousands of, of people. Uh, and the astronauts were just, as you say, at the top of the pyramid. Yeah. You know, your book, David, uh, covers so much about uh, the U.S. space program. And certainly we could go lockstep and talk about each mission, whether it's Apollo 12 getting struck by lightning or the miraculous uh, uh, survival, survival of the Apollo 13 crew or, for that matter, uh, Apollo 17 or uh, – uh, any of the other missions that I can that I could uh, just continue to to tick off at the top of my head, but your book is written in three specific parts. You have part one, which is the moon launch. Part two, you title it "Lessons from Apollo," and part three, you you entitle it "Our Future in Space." Can you first talk about what do you think are the main lessons or messages from? The, the Apollo missions, or what some people have called the spirit of Apollo? Well, I, I think there, there are several of them. Um, the first of which is to be bold, to be audacious. Um, President Kennedy's goal to land on the moon was made when the U.S. just had 15 minutes of spaceflight experience after Alan Shepard's suborbital flight. Um, other bold moves were the decision to send Apollo 8 around the moon. Um, another bold decision was how to get to the moon, the so-called lunar orbit rendezvous approach, uh, which involved two spacecraft uh, um, joining in, in, or around the moon. And this decision was made before anybody had even rendezvoused or, or docked, joined together in space. So th the first is to, to be bold, to aim high. Uh, the, um, the, the second thing uh, is to, um, to be inclusive. Um, the first astronauts were all uh, just uh, male test pilots, uh, and this eventually was broadened to in involve other people, scientists like uh, Harrison Schmidt, who as geologists went on Apollo 17, and then later with the space shuttle um, to include uh, women uh, and to include people of uh, different races and nationalities. Uh, the third lesson is um, no bucks, no buck Rogers. In other words, if you don't have the money, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to be able to perform the missions. Uh, and uh, in, in the book, I talk about how some of the decisions based on budget affected the, the space shuttle program, making it uh, uh, less efficient and more dangerous. So I think that there's a, a no, and another uh, lesson is uh, to be prepared uh, and, for example, the simulations before Apollo 11 uh, gave them the information that allowed them to ignore those computer alarms and not abort the landing. Do you think that um, these lessons that you're uh, kind of indicating here, do you think that NASA in 2019 has lost sight, or maybe maybe I should say this differently. Do you think NASA has this historical memory to uh, remember the lessons uh, of the Apollo era? Well, I think that a lot of people have criticized NASA in recent years for becoming what's called risk averse because of loss of two space shuttle crews, the Challenger and Columbia. Uh, the whole kind of uh, approach of NASA has become much more conservative and that many of the decisions that led to the success of Project Apollo uh, would not have been made that way today, uh, so that NASA is not as bold, is not as audacious. Now, I must say that just in recent weeks, this idea of returning men and women to the moon by 2024, 
that that is bold and, and audacious and uh, will be very difficult to accomplish. But uh, so I, I think that there's some hope for the future. Uh, yeah, I think that if as long as they remember that message of uh, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. Right. And it's a different situation with that. One of the things I talk about in the third part of the book is, is two very important factors in terms of funding for space exploration. The first is international cooperation. So, for example, the International Space Station that's in orbit now and has astronauts aboard is funded not only by the United States, um, but also by other countries, such as European Space Agency, Russia, Japan, Canada, and they're all contributing cost to the cost uh, and uh, expenses, uh, but also um, modules or parts of the International Space Station. And the same type of international cooperation is planned for a new space station around the moon that's going to be called Gateway, uh, that's going to be launched uh, in, in, the, in the next few years. The, the, the second big advance in terms of funding is the involvement of private corporations. And it's very exciting that, for example, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon and one of the world's richest men, he's spending a billion dollars a year of his own money on a company called Blue Origin, which is probably going to launch the first space tourists suborbital flights uh, this year. Uh, and um, also a, a new rocket called New Glenn that will uh, be able to, to put people uh, into orbit. Uh, the other example of this, of course, is uh, SpaceX, founded by Elon Musk, uh, and they've developed a series of Falcon rockets, most recently Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, which have been used to put uh, unmanned payloads into space and will shortly be used to put uh, humans in space aboard the, their Dragon uh, spacecraft. So you're optimistic of the the partnership that NASA has with these uh, uh, private entities that they're going to be able to uh, scale up uh, to the levels of the uh, uh, 1960s and early 1970s. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm optimistic at this point, and I was not a few years ago because uh, NASA was kind of stuck, uh, and it had been given you know differing goals, but not the resources to achieve them. Uh, but now with international partners and uh, with uh, private enterprise, I, I think the, the future is, is bright. Uh, I think that SpaceX especially uh, has really uh, um, been revolutionary in the launch industry to aim for reusable rockets. I mean, would it make any sense if you flew a 747 from New York to Seattle and then threw out the, spa the, the airplane? No, that'd be ridiculous. You, you reuse airplanes. And, and the same way the idea is to reuse rockets uh, and uh, not just dump them in the ocean uh, when they're done with their first launch. Certainly, you know, you, you had to have uh, 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 an individual like uh, uh, Musk or Bezos to uh, put their money where their mouth is and tell these engineers and scientists to, to uh, create these uh, – uh, or develop, I should say, the new ideas like reusability for the for the uh, the rockets and the the space capsules. Do you have any thoughts about uh, the uh, ideas and plans for a Mars mission? And what do you think the magnitude and differences are uh, for uh, anybody to try? To try well, I think that Mars is much harder than the Moon. Uh, the reason for that is the moon is only three days away from Earth, whereas uh, Mars, depending on the, the orbits, um, is, is months away. Uh, and this has important implications. Uh, so, for example, their risk of being in space for long periods of time, uh, specifically from radiation. Uh, and so a long trip to Mars, uh, there's going to need to be answers to effective um, cosmic rays and other types of radiation on uh, people uh, um, flying outside the Van Allen belts, which protect us from such cosmic rays, uh, and also uh, on um, in providing oxygen and water and things like that over a long period of time. So th there's been kind of a, a dichotomy between people that want to go to Mars first and people who argue going back to the moon. Uh, I think that you want to do both. But going back to the moon makes sense because you can use the area in orbit around the moon to test um, mechanical uh, um, devices, uh, to test uh, environmental 
problems to test uh, radiation protection uh, when you're only three days from Earth. So I don't think we have the technology right now to send humans to Mars in the optimal way. Uh, for example, one area of research is new types of rockets that use plasma ion engines that would get people to, instead of taking uh, you know months and months to get to Mars, would get people to Mars much faster. So I think personally that the technology has to advance a bit before we start sending humans to Mars. Now, Elon Musk thinks it can be done a lot quicker, and he's in investing money into a new type of rocket called Starship that might get people to Mars sooner. But I think that the moon first approach is correct. Uh, I gotcha. So, you know, one of the other things I wanted to mention before we wrap up here, David, is we've been talking a lot about the hardware uh, and the uh, 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 tools needed to uh, improve and continue space exploration, whether it's manned or robotic missions. Do you think the education... Uh, uh, institutions in the Western civil in the Western world are up to the task to provide the uh, the the people that are going to be needed uh, to execute these ideas. Yes, I do. You know, you, you have to remember that the first people to land on Mars and to orbit Mars have already been born, and I think there's a tremendous interest among young people. One of the reasons that I wrote this book was to inspire and encourage young people to uh, continue along the road. Um, Apollo 11, in one sense, is ancient history. It's 50 years ago. But in the last part of my book, I talk about all the plans and programs uh, for new rockets, uh, new spacecraft, uh, tourists going into space, and human missions to the moon and Mars. So I think there's a lot to look forward to. Uh, and uh, I do believe that the uh, educational institutions are up to the task. And there's a lot of bright, dedicated uh, young men and women uh, who have set their eyes on the stars, and uh, I want to encourage that. Do you think that the popular culture has kept the, uh, 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 the, the love of science and especially space exploration alive, even though the, the real-world space programs have kind of had their, their peaks and valleys? I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that question. And there's a, um, a lawn landscaper. I'm glad you can edit this. I'm going to go in another room where you're not going to get the landscaper oh, in the background. Oh, that <laughs> that's okay, man. I'll wait here for a second. Wait, I'm just going into the other room now. The landscaper is at the house across the street from us. And a very loud lawnmower. Uh, okay. It's 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 not been a problem. I could barely hear it, and I can I can I can uh, duck that out. No big deal. So okay. what I was so so what I was saying was that um, do you think that popular culture has served a role in keeping the interest in space exploration and science alive? Yes, I, I certainly do. Um, there have been a number of movies uh, that have uh, really uh, encouraged space exploration. I'm starting with the right stuff. Uh, and uh, going to uh, Apollo 13, which is one of my favorite movies, uh, to more recent movies um, such as uh, First Man and uh, Apollo 11, uh, the documentary, which we talked about earlier. Uh, and there's another documentary coming out based on the life of uh, Neil Armstrong. Yes. Uh, now, does, uh, does Hansen have a hand in, in that one as well, or was it the first man uh, project that he uh, participated in? No, you know? um, Jim Hansen, uh, who was Neil Armstrong's biographer, was a co-executive co-producer of uh, First Man. And uh, that the people in that movie made a tremendous effort uh, to make it very, very accurate. And so uh, there are very few complaints about the accuracy of the movie. Uh, I think the main concerns with it have been uh, the portrayal of uh, Armstrong and uh, not showing him uh, smiling and joking enough. And then there, there was kind of a fake news about it, about the American flag. Uh, the American flag was shown frequently in the movie, but there were some people who were upset that they didn't show them actually setting up the flag on the moon. Yeah, that's that's just crazy that you hear stuff like that. But I guess what I was driving at is about this new movie that's coming out about uh, Armstrong, 
was uh, was uh, Dr. Hansen a part of that as well? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, okay, the, the I people, didn't know. The people who were involved with that was actually the Armstrong family uh, and uh, Armstrong's uh, um, uh, sons, uh, Mark and, and uh, Rick Armstrong, uh, provided the uh, filmmakers with uh, access to actual home movies uh, that, of the family that had never really been shown publicly before. Okay, that, that, that'll be interesting to see. I'm looking forward to that. There's going to be so many things that are going to be uh, 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 wonderful to uh, view and listen to as we re- are in the run-up for the 50th anniversary. I suspect, though, David, and you probably agree, is that for the next four or five years, there's just going to be one important event that we're going to have to make note of and talk about. So uh, maybe I can have you back on the podcast when uh, some of the other important milestones of the Apollo missions come up. Mike, I'd, I'd love to talk to you again. Uh, and uh, I put a lot of uh, time and effort. It was a labor of love to write. I was a teenage space reporter. And, you know, there's 15 books or so coming out about Apollo 11 uh, that are either out or in the next couple of months. And I think that mine really has a unique perspective. Uh, you know, I was an eyewitness to history. Uh, absolutely. I, I, you know, like I said at the beginning of, of the program is just simply that you really captured a, a, a feel for the time. And because you were young yourself, you know, you were uh, still in uh, college and you had that perspective. Uh, and, you know, that time will never be uh, 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 recaptured again. And I thought you did a really outstanding job of, uh, uh, of uh, recreating that uh, in your book. One final question. Well, it's a couple of questions here, kind of lightning, lightning round uh, questions. There was a lot of people involved that helped you out to get ready uh, to publish this book. I wanted to see if you could say a couple words about some of these people. Uh, your your friend Marv uh, Rubenstein. Uh, what what's uh, he doing now? He you mentioned in the book that he had gone on to have a PhD in what, in what, uh, uh, field? Uh, Mar- I went into medicine. Marv got a PhD in, uh, immunology and, uh, taught and did research, uh, in immunology and cancer research. And, uh, just, just recently he's completed a book himself uh, about these experiences from a slightly different point of view. Uh, and, uh, he's in the throes of, uh, signing a contract with a book publisher. So, uh, I'm hoping that in uh, another year or so, we'll have his perspective as well. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll be looking forward to that. Uh, uh, the, the, we'll call it the Marv Chronicles or something. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the other, uh, a couple of other people I wanted to ask you about. Um, uh, I saw in, uh, in your book that uh, you uh, uh, had uh, worked with uh, Robert Perlman. Tell us, tell me about uh, your relationship and, and how he helped you uh, kind of get it together on the book. Well, Robert Perlman uh, didn't uh, directly, uh, you know, edit the book or anything like that. But Rob has been a tremendous encouragement uh, to me through the years. Um, Robert Perlman founded a uh, blog on the internet called Collect Space, and this was back in 1999. And Robert is one of the pioneers of using the internet uh, to promote space exploration and specifically uh, collecting space memorabilia, uh, which has become a a big deal. And uh, Robert is one of the people, I think, that has promoted a tremendous interest uh, in the public as large in terms of uh, space, and especially through his pioneering use of the internet. Uh, And uh, so um, I give him credit in the acknowledgments uh, for maintaining that public enthusiasm. You know, the thing that I had no idea was that there's this whole industry of the autographs. Uh, You're a big uh, participant at the Space Fest uh, festival that goes on every year, but I had no idea how crazy it was for the, 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 the signatures that people were trying to get and uh, the, the, it sounded like the baseball card world where it was just cutthroat crazy. What do you think about all that? Well, years ago, um, astronauts used to sign 
autograph requests for free. Now, at one point, they started getting so many that they had to use a mechanical device called an auto pen that secretaries would use to, to sign uh, pictures and things like that sent to them. Uh, but um, it was very informal. And especially with the rise of the internet and with eBay, there actually became a market for these astronaut autographs. So the astronauts got upset because they were signing things for free and then people were profiting off their signatures, uh, which, which wasn't fair. Uh, and so astronauts had different approaches to this. Um, Neil Armstrong had been very generous signing autographs. It estimated he signed over 100,000 autographs. But on the 25th anniversary of the flight, he stopped signing any autographs whatsoever. Uh, and, uh, and that other astronauts, such as Buzz Aldrin, uh, decided to start charging for their autographs. Uh, and uh, Aldrin charged up to uh, $600 in recent years for his autograph. And a good portion of his uh, funds came from uh, autograph and meeting, signing, and speaking uh, fees. <laughs> well, it just shows that, you know, celebrities uh, of any uh, uh, interest uh, have to make a living and eat. So, you know, I think it's uh, okay for those astronauts to charge whatever they feel that uh, an autograph is worth because they did uh, – sometimes pay with the uh, incredible consequences, that opportunity to fly in space. So uh, I wanted to ask you about some of the uh, astronauts that wrote uh, testimonials for your book. Um, how did you uh, 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 meet and then convince some of these guys to uh, write uh, blurbs for your uh, book? Well, I've known uh, Fred Hayes, who was the lunar module pilot on Apollo 13, uh, for a number of years. Uh, we first met at uh, the first Space Fest, this annual meeting, uh, and uh, started having breakfast over oatmeal at the, the local Starbucks. Uh, and so I've gotten to know Fred through the years. And so um, I had asked him uh, when I was finishing the book if he would consider writing a what's called a blurb or advanced praise for the book, and he readily agreed. Uh, and then um, as, as a result of that, I um, approached some other astronauts who I had also met, um, mainly uh, and most prominently uh, Charlie Duke, who was the uh, capsule communicator for Apollo 11. Uh, and uh, so um, he, he also agreed to, to write for the, the book. Uh, and, as well as uh, Al Warden, who was the, lunar, the command module pilot on Apollo 15. So I, I had gotten to know these astronauts, um, some better than others, uh, th through the years. And uh, I was very honored to, um, to have them uh, write uh, these blurbs. And uh, I recently got a wonderful email from Fred Hayes uh, that uh, stated that uh, he thought the book was good, and he said he even learned a few things. <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, uh, I also noticed that uh, 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 the commander of Space Shuttle uh, 3 uh, also gave you a testimonial. Yeah. Um, Jack Lausma, I've known for many years. We, we both are University of Michigan graduates and, uh, you know, have, 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 shared, uh, have shared that. Uh, and uh, he, um, uh, again, I've seen him at a number of these uh, space fests and uh, he... Um, uh, agreed right away to uh, to uh, um, look the book over and, and sign a, a blurb for it. You know, it's it sounds like it's a pretty informal thing because you've clearly had this interest in still being a part of the world of uh, NASA and space exploration. And I would just say globally, you know, don't, we don't have to say NASA, just space exploration. You, you, some of these guys are real informal with you and it's because you've been kind of been around since uh, the beginning in in many ways. Do you feel that uh, you've uh, been very fortunate to uh, maintain these relationships over the decades? Yeah, I mean, I, in many ways, I'm the luckiest guy uh, around. Uh, not only did I was I born in the right place and right time to be able to cover Apollo 11 as a college student. Uh, but I've got a chance to meet uh, these remarkable people. Uh, and um, some of the highlights of the last few years with that was at two of the Space Fests, 
And at one of them, I was able to have dinner at the same table with Buzz Aldrin and another one to have dinner and sit right next to Mike Collins, uh, as well as seeing Neil Armstrong at, at a couple of other uh, events. Uh, and um, it was it was great uh, to um, sit next to Mike Collins, and I showed him my picture of the, their walkout. And he asked me if I knew what was in the paper bag that you referred to lately. And I told him <laughs> exactly what was in the paper bag, that it was a, um, a trophy trout uh, plaque uh, that was a gag gift from the pad leader, Gunter Wavent. You know, the funny thing about that story when you told that, uh, when I when I uh, when I remember seeing that uh, some of the film that 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 uh, documented that walkout, and I'm wondering why is he carrying a, a shopping bag? You know, everybody else has got like oxygen tanks and ventilators and moon moon helmets on, and you know, there's a uh, there's Mike Collins with a, a Hudson's bag, and I'm like. What has he got in there? So I'm glad you have finally told me what the heck's going on there. Well, with, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Right. You know, I, I talked about how First Man tried to be very, very accurate. And one of the things that you clearly see in First Man during their portrayal of the walkout uh, is, is the paper bag in Mike Collins' right hand uh, next to his uh, um, uh, environmental unit. Yeah. You know, uh, one of my friends is Ryan Nagata. And uh, – you know, he uh, had a lot to do with some of the practical uh, 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 prop uh, development for that film. He's he's and, Mr. Spacesuit Guy. He makes uh, in- incredible replicas of uh, NASA spacesuits. Yeah, he's he's just incredibly detailed. You know, and and y- you almost think that the thing would work. You know, by the time he's done with it. You know, even though it's just a movie prop, it just has to look good on camera. Very fascinating. Well. Finally, uh, David, before before we call it quits here, because it's about twelve thirty, um, you know, I wanted to ask you about um, meeting some of the uh, other people that are part of the the space uh, uh, historic historian world. Uh, uh, Francis French, uh, tell me how you uh, you know uh, uh, Francis. Well, Francis French has been a, a great friend of mine. Um, one of the first space events I went to uh, was this kind of uh, um, autograph show uh, in back in 2006. Uh, and uh, one of the people there was the Mercury astronaut Wally Schirra, who had already always been a big hero of mine. And uh, um, Francis and I talked a couple of times at the show. Uh, and then the next year, uh, he and Wally and uh, Dee O'Hara, the astronaut nurse, and a few other people were having breakfast. And uh, Francis invited me to sit down next to Wally Shira. And this was one of the uh, very uh, um, uh, great uh, events uh, that got me very interested uh, in, um, you know, in, in meeting some of these astronauts. So, so I've known Francis since 2006, and uh, he was the former... Um, had a space education at the San Diego Air and Space Museum and uh, has written uh, um, th- three books uh, on uh, space exploration. That's uh, really, really cool, man. And, and, and I Francis, um, I was very, very lucky in that other, some other space authors, you know, I was a fledgling author. This is the first and only book I've written, written but a number of other space authors were very kind to uh, read parts of the manuscript and make suggestions uh, and corrections. And uh, Francis was one of them and was very, very helpful. What was uh, maybe, what what sticks in your mind as uh, the biggest thing you learned as a writer uh, in, the, in, in uh, the creation of I Was a Teenage Space Reporter compared to your experience many, many years ago as a journalist, or for that matter, writing uh, and editing uh, peer review papers uh, with your world as a as a physician, what was the big surprise about uh, writing this book? Well, you know, there's an old saying: nothing good happens fast. And one of the th- things that I learned about it is that writing a book is an extremely long process. Actually, from conception to the book coming out uh, April second, uh, it was a four year journey. Uh, it took over two and a half years to actually write the book. And then it took months to find an agent, to find a publisher, uh, and to uh, go through the whole editorial process, uh, which was very important uh, until it came out. 
Yeah, I would imagine that, you know, realizing that you're going to have to go through many, many drafts to, to, to get it to, so that not only are you happy with it, but uh, your editor is happy with it as well. Um, well, David, you know, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking time today out of your busy schedule to uh, talk to me about your wonderful book. Uh, once again, everybody, the book is called I Was a Teenage Space Reporter, and the subtitle is From Apollo 11 to Our Future in Space. David Chudwin, thank you very much for uh, being on Dreamers to Makers. It's been a pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the podcast today. My name is Mike Dawson, and I am the producer, music composer, and host of Dreamers to Makers. I want to thank again David Chudwin for being on the podcast. Be sure to get a copy of his book, I Was a Teenage Space Reporter, published by LID Publishing. All the music you heard on the podcast can be found at my website, RoarElectra.com, or you can get my entire discography at RoarElectra.Bandcamp.com. You can find my Dreamers to Makers podcast anywhere podcasts are found, and also at Dreamers to Makers home, which is AssignmentUniverse.com. Stay tuned for more news about the podcast and other projects. But for now, goodbye, old friends. See you next time on Dreamers to Makers. Makers.